Okay, is this working? Yes, very good. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's session. It's the very first session of this academic year of Room for Discussion, and we are delighted to welcome you today. Of course, what better way is to begin this year with a brand new podium, a large open-minded audience, um, a controversial topic, and of course, one of the most exciting philosophers of this day and age. Today's topic is um, quite a controversial topic. We talk about poverty, inequality, and global justice. Now, 2015 has been the target year for the Millennium Goals. The Millennium Goals, which should have brought us a more just world with less poverty and less inequality. And then again, reports are being published which state that over 22,000 children die each day due to the conditions of extreme poverty. So what, where are we really in the fight against poverty? Where are we going in the fight against poverty? And where should we go? Today we're going to talk about this topic with one of the experts of global justice. He is currently the Professor of Philosophy and International Affairs at Yale University, as well as the Director of the Global Justice Program at Yale University. He did his PhD at the University of Harvard under the supervision of John Rawls, and he got famous for his paper, Realizing Rawls. He is really the academic backbone in the fight against poverty. And I'm very pleased that he came to Amsterdam only to join us on this session today. If you want to join the discussion, you can do so by just walking to the microphone, which is over there. And you can also join the debate on Twitter via hashtag RFD. But now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please put your hands together for Dr. Thomas Poggi. Dr. Poggi, before um, obtaining your PhD at Harvard, um, you actually studied uh, sociology in Hamburg, uh, if I'm not mistaken. There's a lot of students here in the audience. What kind of student were you back in the day? Well, I was quite politicized. This was a very political age, so it was in the mid-70s, the tail end of the Vietnam War. Uh, I was, for one thing, a walking encyclopedia on the war. I knew all the details about how much tonnage had been dropped here, what the Phoenix program was doing, the Tiger Division that the Koreans had sent to Vietnam to help with the torture of prisoners and so forth. So I did a lot of that on the side, but I also was a pretty diligent student, learned a lot uh, during that period, and uh, felt that I didn't learn enough, actually. That's what, one reason why I went to Harvard, to go for a year and really sort of see what a challenging academic environment would be like. And, and is the Vietnam War, you mentioned it at mm -hmm. once, is that one of the first moments or situations uh, of which you got inspired to study more on global justice issues? Uh, certainly it played a role. It was, yeah, it was probably the first thing that was directly related to global justice. I remember one other thing from earlier childhood, which was a big experience for me that was also global justice related, and that was the discovery that I was growing up among people who had just done something rather remarkable, namely started the Second World War and eradicated 12 million people in concentration camps. And that's for a young boy quite a remarkable discovery. You know, you uh, live among these adults and they all seem pretty normal and actually rock solid, sort of reliable people who help you and tell you what the world is like and so on. And then I learned about this and I said, oops, you know, is this all these nice people were just Nazis and... Something, something was evidently going wrong. Yeah, and that uh, generated in me a lifelong anti-authoritarian streak, sort of a thing, a deep skepticism, you know, when people tell you something with a sense of authority, make your own judgment, think about, think for yourself and see whether it's really true and uh, you have to, you know, I was for a while, sort of at eight or so, when I learned this, I was deeply skeptical about the adult world and their pronouncements. And we're now here at the Fanac uh, Faculty of Economics and Business. Um, most people are maybe trying to uh, look for a job, make some uh, money. Are you surprised that so many people came for a topic such a heavy topic such as global justice? 
Uh, not particularly surprised. I think that this is a topic that for Europeans now, and especially with the migrant crisis upon us and so on and so forth, I mean, it's a thing that in Europe people think about maybe more than in the United States. Uh, Europe is a world in which there are many different countries, so there is an international dimension in everybody's life simply because you're dealing with Europeans at least. Uh, so you think about international affairs, you have a diversity of cultures, even just flipping through the TV channels, you get a diversity of perspectives that would be quite dramatic by American standards where it's the same sort of stuff uh, on all the channels. So I'm not surprised that there's more interest in Europe and certainly in a city like Amsterdam in global justice issues than there would be in a comparable university in the United States. Is it something that has changed over time? Is it, are people more interested in these topics nowadays than mm -hmm. in your time when you were a student? Um, Hard for me to judge for Amsterdam in particular. Worldwide, I would say there was more interest when I was a student. In, right. uh, and I mean, we were all into the Vietnam War right. and issues that were related to it, you know, what was happening in Latin America at the time and so forth. So we were very focused on these international issues, even though maybe less focused on issues of poverty and so forth, but uh, war and peace issues we were heavily focused on. Right. Then let, let's start talking about these international is mm. issues and making your own judgment. Since uh, 2015, as mentioned before, was the target year of the Millennium Goals. The Millennium Goals, which has been signed by over, I think, 189 countries um, with various directions, fight against poverty, fight against hunger, uh, fight for more equality, gender equality. Um, now, 2015 has been the target year. Can we be satisfied with the results? Well, we can be, but should we be? No, I don't think so. I think that the Millennium Development Goals have had very little impact on the real world. They, uh, you know, if you look at the 1980s, 1990s, uh, and then the last 15 years, progress against poverty by any objective measure is roughly constant. Uh, the average income in the world is rising, and a little bit of that rise of average income is trickling down to the poor. That has happened in the 80s, in the 90s, and in the last 15 years and it wasn't particularly more. Uh, there was a noticeable improvement in global health, uh, and three of the MDGs were focused on global health, and that's partly due to Gates Foundation Initiative, uh, PEPFAR, the Global Fund. Uh, they've really made a difference against the three big diseases, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. But apart from that, in terms of hunger, in terms of poverty, and so on, uh, the progress has been abysmal, I would say. And there has been, of course, more recorded progress, but that progress has more to do with cosmetic uh, achievements on how to present the numbers yeah. than with actual progress. So if you like, I can say a little bit about... Yeah, let, let's talk about that. One example, yeah. So uh, one example is hunger, right? Uh, you think that the number of chronically undernourished people in the world, that's a pretty objective number. They, we can more or less count that. We normally uh, know what that is. But again, that number has been horribly manipulated over the years. We started in 1996 at the World Food Summit in Rome, where 186 governments agreed that they would half the number of chronically undernourished people by 2015. So, so what was, was the, do you sort of know the, an estimation of what was the number back then? Yeah, the official number was 794 million, and so the target number was 397 million. And uh, what, they, uh, what they did is they uh, looked at the, for the next four years or so at how the number would develop, and they found that hunger was actually increasing every year. 1996, it turned out, was a low. Uh, so it had declined to that point, and then it was going up. And then when they wrote the Millennium Declaration, which was what they adopted in New York in September 2000, they said, okay, we have to make sure that we are not overambitious here. Let's have chronic undernutrition by the year 2015, but now define it differently. Let's define it as a ratio to the world's population. So we are halving not the number of hungry people, but the proportion of the world's people who are chronically undernourished. Th and that, that's a big difference, That's isn't a it? big difference because, of course, the world population goes up. And as the world's population goes up, the permissible number of hungry people goes up with it. 
And so instead of a target of 397, you get a target of 480 million. Then they formulated the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. They are often defended or often characterized as being just a restatement of the Millennium Declaration, but that is not true. What happened was that all the goals that were formulated in the Millennium Declaration were backdated by the Millennium Goals to 1990. So that means that they took a different baseline and in particular, counted all the progress that the Chinese had made against poverty, hunger, and so on. China is a very big country. Counted all that great progress of the 1990s towards achievement of the Millennium Development Goals, even though those development goals were formulated only in the year 2000. So instead of taking 2000 as a baseline for the next 15 years, they took 1990 as a baseline to, do you for the say, next 25 portray... Years. To portray better progress? Exactly. Progress? So you lengthen the period in which the population of the developing countries is growing, and so you get more of the work done simply by population growth, and you need to do less work by reducing the number of hungry people. But then still, have we achieved something? Or can we be... Um, I mean, there, there was progress, right? There, there was... Let me there, get to that, yeah. There, there, so what then happened there's was... There's less people living in extreme poverty. Hang on. So what then happened was that the number of hungry people, even the proportion of hungry people, sort of the number went up and up. The proportion went down a little bit, but nowhere near enough to half the number, I mean, the proportion of hungry people in the world. For and then yeah. at the, in the crucial year 2012, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, decided that they were going to change their methodology for counting the hungry. So they developed and unveiled a new improved methodology according to which the number of hungry people was falling through the entire period rather than increasing as the previous methodology had uh, unveiled. So this happened despite the fact that, as we all know, food prices doubled between 2005 and 2008 and then again 2011, so they had twin peaks in food prices. Poor people never noticed it. Poor people became less and less numerous during that period. And so officially, we have not achieved the, that particular MDG, which is MDG 1, but we have dramatically reduced now, according to the improved methodology, uh, undernutrition in the world. Now, the new definition of undernutrition is so remarkable that I want to quickly sketch course, it, if please, I may. Yeah. So, you are undernourished if you fulfill three conditions according to the new improved uh, methodology. The first condition is you are short of energy, calories. If you are short of anything else, like vitamin A, like so many people are in the developing world, or short of uh, iron, again, anemia, so many people in the developing world are short of that. You're not undernourished. The only way you can be undernourished is if you don't get enough energy or calories, which is another way of saying that the entire undernutrition problem in the world can be solved by sugary soft drinks dispensed by Coca-Cola, just adding energy. The second thing is that you have to be short of the minimum requirements of a sedentary lifestyle, which is 1,800 calories for a fully grown adult. Of course, many people in the developing world do real serious work. They're rickshaw drivers, they're housewives who have to get water from distant places, carrying large chunks of water on their heads and so on. They spend many more calories than the 1800 that I consume by typing on my computer. Nevertheless, you count as undernourished by the standards of the FAO only if you fall short of that 1800 calorie line, what you need for a sedentary lifestyle. So, long story short, the whole methodology is, is the main problem, am I right? The methodology is a methodology that dramatically undercounts the hungry. And who, who benefits of whole, this whole wrong portraying of the world's hungry? Well, the politicians who want to defend their globalization project, right? The politicians in the 1990s came to us and they said, we want the WTO, we want this globalization, this neoliberal experiment, and 
what we promise you is everybody will benefit. This is good for the world. This is going to lift all boats. It's going to help the hungry and so on. And so, of course, the politicians are very eager to show that their globalization worked. But the, the politicians is maybe a, a bit of a, a generalization. Is well, there, who, who, are, who is to blame in your eyes? Which politicians? Well, it's, uh, there's more than one politician to right. blame, right? I mean, the people who supported globalization are mainly the governments of the rich northern states who benefited the most from globalization. Their companies, their multinational corporations benefit. So the U.S. government is a great pusher of globalization and is, of course, very eager to show that it worked, that it was successful. Uh, and the ones that are standing behind the U.S. government, behind the northern governments, are the big corporations who, whose project that was, who wrote the rules of globalization and who are particularly eager to achieve a continuation of that project, right? They want you all to believe that as the Millennium Development Goals show, this has been good for everybody, poverty has been eradicated, billions of people have been lifted out of poverty, as it's always said, and so you should just continue to support us and we will guide and steer globalization in the right direction, uh, making sure that not just we benefit, but everybody in the world. That's the reigning ideology. Now, l let us get back to the, to the status quo. Mm -hmm. well, you already explained what's going on uh, in the fight against hunger. Um, what is going on in the fight against poverty? Is it exactly the same? Are they just playing with uh, numbers and statistics? Yeah, it's essentially the same. What happened uh, amusingly during the period before 2012, before the FAO changed its methodology, Every year, the World Bank would publish a tremendous success story in poverty. The number of poor has fallen like a brick. It's lower and lower. And the FAO was saying every year, oh, the number of hungry has gone up and gone up and gone up. And so people like myself were saying very loudly, you know, this can't be right. The World Bank numbers must be wrong because if hunger is going up, how can poverty be going down, right? Because most of what poor people spend their money on is, in fact, food. And... Then, I guess the World Bank got annoyed by this kind of criticism and leaned upon the FAO, as did other uh, government officials, and said to the FAO, you know, you have to deliver better numbers. You can't be uh, delivering these ridiculous numbers of hunger going up. So think of something, do something in order to improve your numbers. trend numbers. Yeah, so and of course the FAO is a weak and politically exposed organization that needs governments of the world for their budgets, whose chief officials are appointed by governments, and so they were in no position to resist. They said, okay, we'll deliver better numbers. We find a methodology that looks better. So the World uh, Bank uses a poverty line with uh, 1.25, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, yes, I mean, that's what they now use. They started with a dollar a day. And that dollar a day, in terms of which the MDGs were formulated, that was a dollar in 1985 currency. Then they went to a dollar eight a day in 1993 currency, and then they went to a dollar 25 a day in 2005 currency. Each time they lowered the poverty line. That's important to understand. A lower poverty line delivers a better looking poverty trend. And, of course, it's ridiculous in a world in which average incomes are increasing constantly to lower the poverty line. If they had stayed to the original dollar a day 1985, that's worth about $1.83 in 2005 currency. But what they're actually using now is $1.25 in 2005 currency. What, what would be currency. an efficient poverty line then to measure the poverty of this world? Or well, a just poverty line. Yeah, so uh, if you want it in money metric terms, I would say somewhere around $5 a day is what we should use, right? I mean, if you think about the purchasing, but what can you actually purchase for $5 a day in the United States in 2005? That's precious little, and uh, I think anything below that is quite ridiculous. But I'm against a money metric poverty line. I don't think poverty should be measured in terms of money. And I've actually done a four-year study where we went to six poor countries and talked to thousands of very poor people about what poverty is really like and what they think poverty consists in, what the dimensions of poverty are, what the gradations of poverty are. And we developed something called the individual deprivation measure, or IDM, 
that is based on what we heard from poor people. It's a multi-dimensional measure. It has 15 dimensions. In each dimension, it's scalar. It has five levels in each dimension. And it is focused on individuals for the first time, whereas all other poverty measurement heretofore was always based on households. And if you would have to make an estimation, how many people are living under your theory or under your well, methods? Well, uh, we have only done it in the Philippines so far, so it would be very hard to make an estimation. But, and also we don't have a firm line. What we have, we, we don't want to have a firm poverty line because a firm poverty line that counts as equally bad all the people below and equally good all the people above focuses the attention of politicians on the people just below the line because those are the cheapest and easiest to lift above, right? And so what we are saying is priority should be given to people who are far below the line, if they wear a line, I mean the, the poorest of the poor. And so we think of poverty as a gradation. You know, we should focus on the people who are at the bottom and try to raise their position as much as possible, but we should not be indifferent to people who are higher up. So we don't have a firm line, unlike the World Bank. Uh, and back again to the World Bank. Um, I, I always um, learned that the World Bank was there for developing countries, uh, giving out loans sometimes for special con um, sp at, at the expense of good governance or etc. So in a sense, um, the World Bank is there for developing nations, but I sort of have the idea that you're very critical and skeptical of the World Bank. Um, is, is the, what is the ultimate goal for the World Bank in your eyes? Uh, I mean, ask yourself, who is leading the World Bank? It's always an American appointed by the US government. Who has voting shares in the World Bank? Well, most voting shares again go to the US and to the uh, Europeans. So uh, obviously the World Bank is beholden to the interests of the United States and the leading northern countries. And it is an organization that presents itself as dreaming of a world without poverty, as being focused on poverty and so on. But if you look at their activities, you have to say that these activities are much more driven by those people, unsurprisingly, by those people who run the organization than by the supposed intended beneficiaries of this organization. And then, so do you have the idea that those people who are in charge of those very important institutions, like the World Bank, um, intrinsically r represent their own interest? Do you, do you think they... Um, uh, like I said, uh, do you think they really work for their own country or, and, and not for developing countries at all? Well, I wouldn't say not at all, right? I mean, it's important that the World Bank should appear to be interested in development and poor people and so on. And so they publish a five-volume report, Voices of the Poor, where they record what poor people say. And they publish that and they say, look, now n nobody can deny that we care. We care deeply. We publish five volumes, Voices of the Poor. So, of course, they have to do something that makes it appear as though they care about poverty, but ultimately their policies are driven not by the interests of the office holders, but by the interests of the governments that have as the decisive say over the policies of these And those are mostly Western governments. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. has 18% or so voting share on, on the World Bank, and, you know, the... Uh, I mean, the, the famous stories about how Stiglitz was fired from the World Bank. Uh, the professor of economics. Professor of economics, yeah, when he was the chief economist of the World Bank, right? I don't know the, the exact details of the story, but apparently Wolfenson got the to uh, call from the Treasury Department of the United States saying you will not be reappointed unless you fire Stiglitz. Because Stiglitz was very critical was of his critical own institution. Of, yeah. Now, um, besides changing the numbers mm. in a more favorable wa uh, way for the politicians. Um, how can they benefit from the system? So how do we benefit from the system which we impose on more developing nations, besides changing the numbers of... Yeah, who's measuring? the we here? Is the we citizens of the Netherlands? or? So let's, let's uh, start with uh, us as sort of, as you mentioned, uh, mostly powerful Western mm. governments. Um, so how does 
the, the first world benefit from this, as you call, yeah. institutional arrangement? Yeah, so I think it's not so much the first world as it is a much more specific group, namely the group of multinational corporations, big banks, hedge funds, billionaires. They are driving the globalization agenda. So how do they benefit? Well, I mean, there are hundreds of examples. One example, just to pick one at random, is intellectual property rights, right? Before 1995, before the World Trade Organization came into existence, intellectual property rights were settled at the national level and different countries had different regimes. Uh, the most advanced countries had very stringent intellectual property rights. Uh, the uh, developing countries had very, very lacks intellectual property rights because it didn't benefit them. They were not in a position to develop many new things and so they were essentially paying for intellectual property and not getting much back. This was a thorn in the side of the big multinational corporations. They wanted to make money with the intellectual property not just in the rich countries but also in the poor countries. And so they got together the big industries, software, entertainment, uh, pharmaceuticals, agribusinesses, they got together, they agreed on what kind of global intellectual property regime they wanted, and they went to Washington and told Clinton at the time, this is what you have to bring home for us from Uruguay. If you go there, bring that home for us, get us uniform, very strong intellectual property rights. And Clinton, made that a condition of the new international trading regime, even though it has nothing to do with trade, really. But he said, look, if you want to trade with us and get most favored nation status in exporting to the United States, you will have to adopt intellectual property rights that are very stringent like ours are. 20-year patents, product patents on pharmaceuticals, for example. So this is in the, in the 1990s? That is in the 1990s. The developing countries got a grace period of 10 years to adapt. India came under this regime on the 1st of January 2005. It passed implementing legislation in December 2004. And India, of course, is the big or was the big drugstore for the world, right? Whenever a new medicine came on the market, Indian clever generic companies would retro engineer that medicine, competing different generic companies competing against each other, and they would sell within a year or so that medicine at very low prices to Indian consumers and to patients all over the developing world, which had cheap intellectual property, big intellectual property rights, not in the rich countries. But so it, it had a reason, of course. I mean, if I invent something here, mm -hmm. you'd like to protect it by those rights. Wh yeah, what you, makes it different? You want to protect it. I mean, that's right. So a pharmaceutical company like Novartis or Pfizer or something, they make a lot of money by having a monopoly. And so they sell to patients in Europe, patients in the United States, and so what they said is, why not try to make money on rich people in India? India now has also some rich people. So what we want to do is make money of those guys too. And the only way we can do that is by preventing those rich people in India from buying generic medicines locally made in India. And so we have to arm twist the Indian government into creating these monopolies also in India. And as a foreseeable side effect of that, the not rich people in India, which is the vast, vast majority of the country, will lose their access to new medicines. So you, basically what you're saying is that the big multinational corporations are uh, responsible for, for what is happening over there. So basically we, people who are not in multi, uh, multinational corporations mm -hmm. are not responsible for oh, what is I'm going on. I'm not there. saying that for a moment, no. No? Uh, <laughs> no, you don't get off that, that quickly. So the thing is, the international rules that are often very detrimental to the world's poor, which is the majority of the world's population, these international rules are made in negotiations among governments. And your government, the government of the Netherlands, plays a role there both within formulating the EU position, but often also independently. And, of course, the Netherlands government is lobbied by multinational corporations. That is true. And multinational corporations have a lot to answer for. But ultimately, this is your government. You are voting for this government. You have a way to influence that government. And if you let multinational corporations... Uh, determine Netherlands government policy, then you are responsible for it. So we have a personal responsibility to 
We'll he head out to a question from the audience. Work, please. Yes, it does work. Hi, my name is Jason Heinen. I'm from California, United States. But building on the question you just asked, is there not societal constructs such as institutionalized racism or a lack of education about the, glo like the global situation that leads to these issues? Or can we really just blame large governments like the US or large international corporations? So uh, does racism uh, drive this? I don't think racism drives anything like, for example, the globalization of intellectual property rights. This was not driven by racism. This was driven by, as you said, by the fact that uh, uh, multinational corporations that had a strong interest in or had a lot of intellectual property, they said, now that some people in the developing world are getting rich, we want those people also to pay for using our innovations. You know, I don't think this had much to do with racism because they're charging you too and you are white. There's another question, thank you for your... We have another question? Yeah, uh, in your 2011 article, Are We Violating the Human Rights of the Global Poor? You talk about this, about our responsibility with the harm we do to, to the global poor. But a solution you give that we should give some money to some charity or whatever, to help the global poor. However, you said now, yeah, we are voting for those governments. Don't you think that our duty is to vote for more capable government, for better government, who change those institutions? So that our duty is to stop kicking the global poor instead of just paying the bill, the hospital bill. Yeah, absolutely right. So uh, what I said in that article is that if it turns out that the root of structural reform, of trying to change things politically, if you feel that you can contribute to that or if that doesn't work for whatever reason, you still have the other option of giving to effective charities. But I see that as a second best option and I wanted to emphasize with regard to that option that you should give not with the sense of I'm doing something good to help people, but with the sense of I'm compensating for the harm that we together do to poor uh, people by imposing on them a set of global rules that foreseeably and avoidably uh, cause enormous human rights deficits among them. So the preferred option is obviously always the option of political reform, of trying to change things in such a way that these charitable donations would become unnecessary. I agree completely. Thank you. Talking about this uh, compensation, yeah, thank you very much. Um, some people are concerned that if we r are really going to change uh, the international system and uh, how we deal with developing nations, that we have to have or make major cutbacks on the living standards we have. Is that true? Would you agree with that? Uh, it depends on how big the change is. So just think about the global distribution of income as it is today, right? The poorest half of the world's population now has 4%, 4% of global income. Now, in order to eradicate all the human rights deficits in the world today, they would need about 7%, or if we are generous, maybe 10%. There would still be 90% left for the top half of the human population. And you can already see, right, that the top 5% of the human population have somewhere around 30, 40% of world income. And even if that all came out of their own pockets, it would still leave a tremendous amount of money for the people at the top. And, With, st yeah. right, and still, um, you've given us some percentages, like 7% of the world's uh, GDP. But if, for example, um, there's a 1% decline in the Netherlands of uh, G GDP, mm -hmm. there's a major catastrophe in the country, there's political uh, worries, uh, people crying out loud. How can the world sort of uh, cope with yeah, div distributing mm -hmm. the money more equally? Yeah, so I mean, there is a major catastrophe if the Dutch average income goes down 1%. I mean... Like you, emotionally, yeah, of course. Yeah, I know, emotionally. I, I feel for you. My heart is bleeding, you know. And, but hell, if, if you guys have 1% less, and if the... the I mean, I, I've, I know the Netherlands pretty well, and I know how, you know, just look at all the cars parked on the street and how, uh, how nicely dressed you all are and 
how well nourished you all are and so on. And you can see how tall you all are, right? I mean, I was just in India and just you see all these little people. And why are they so small? Not because they have different genes. They are so small because they suffered malnutrition while they were growing up, right? So uh, I can't get very excited about that catastrophe that you are mentioning of the Dutch losing 1% of their income. You have to learn that you are beneficiaries with your income of highly unjust arrangements and you have to ask yourself, do I want this extra percent even at the expense of lots of lots of people going hungry in the poorer countries? So, and so you could have 10% less and you would be very happy. You wouldn't know the difference. So the, the follow-up of the, the first sort of um, description that we are imposing a sort of institutional arrangement or our governments and mm. multinational corporations then uh, leads to a responsibility for us to act. Is that what you're trying to say to us? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. And a responsibility that I would add is a negative responsibility. So you have to get out of the pattern where you see yourself as bystanders to poverty in the developing world and you ask yourself, sort of Peter Singer style, you ask yourself... You know, should I or should I not give up, sacrifice as the word is, sacrifice some of my wealth in order to save some children in the developing world. And you have to get into a new frame of mind where you say, should I continue through my government to participate in the imposition of deeply unjust rules upon the world under which foreseeably and avoidably billions and billions of people cannot meet their basic needs? Or should I try to refrain from that, try to stop participating in that imposition and prevail upon my government no longer to invoke my name as legitimation for what they do at the in international level? In some of your works, you uh, made even a more harsher claim. There's all these people dying every day because of poverty-related causes, and you mm. call it uh, unnecessary poverty. And then, indeed, am I a passive bystander? Um, you have uh, compared the Germans' passive support to Nazism even mm. to the passive support of the international system. Is that something you still um, agree with or yeah, think? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Th this is basically the German government at the time did extremely unjust things, including unjust things in this very country. And those people who continued business as usual, who continued paying their taxes, who maybe went to rallies and uh, manifested support and so on, those people were part of a large collective organism that together was doing that harm. Right? So it wasn't just, uh, this is what the Germans said afterwards, they said, well, these Nazis came and they, they took over and they, you know, they did all these evil things and, and we just watched. Well, excuse me, no, they were involved uh, by participating in the economy, by serving as soldiers in factories, to, you know, in, but, in but whatever But this is still is, is like a, a one of the major atrocities ever happened in human history. Yes. Um, poverty is too. Isn't that a, 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 a just a step too far or something to think? Why is it a step too far? I mean, more people are uh, killed by poverty. So if you look at the last 25 years, about 450 million people died from poverty-related causes in that period. Most of them died avoidably simply because our global economy is set up in a way that maldistributes income to such an enormous extent. The entire Second World War killed only 60 million people. I'm not belittling that. 60 million people is enormous and the suffering of the Second World War was horrible. But sorry, poverty is killing vastly more people and we are just as actively involved in killing those people than the Germans were in killing uh, the Poles and the Jews and the Russians and so on who, were, who died in the Second World War. So this is what is happening. Um, and before we're going to start about possible solutions in the future, maybe is there still a question from the audience? We have two more questions. I, uh, I just have two uh, names I want to drop. The first is Jacques Fresco from the Venus Project and uh, Herman Daly, working in the World Bank, he told us that uh, most of the stuff you learn in economics is bullshit. You just throw it away. And what do you think of his ecological economics idea? 2008 article. Oh, oh, I'm not sure what, what do I'm... Do you know Herman Daly? He worked in the World Bank, uh, professor I don't, no. of economics. No, uh, well, no, anyway, he, he proposed ec uh, ecological economics. 
caring yeah. only about the no, environment. No, I'm sorry, I can't comment on that. I'm sorry, don't All know. Right. Uh, just one last question. Uh, do you know Slavyov Sisek, the philosopher? Who? Slavyov Sisek. Zizek? Yeah. Yeah, vaguely, not in any depth. All right. Well, then, uh, then I'm all out. Okay. <laughs> out of luck. Then we're going to move on to the other question. Hi. Uh, my name is Akshat. I got to the country about three weeks ago, so some of your rhetoric is very familiar to me, especially against the pharma lobby in the United States. My question to you is, and what was very counterintuitive to me as a, as a student of economics, was the WTO essentially integrates some of the poorer economies into the, into the global, economy global economy and links them. And at the same time, it's very important to foster innovation in the developed countries that have the facilities to develop new drugs, etc. So a lot of what you said seemed counterintuitive to say that it's primarily exploitative and you have been critical of the WTO. My question to you is, what is the other alternative? And is that really not integrative economically? Uh, no, I'm very strongly in favor of globalization with a capital G. So I want the world to be integrated. I want it to be globalized. What I'm disputing is the rules under which that takes place. So just to be specific about this matter of intellectual property rights, Innovators should be rewarded. I think it's a very good thing for them to be rewarded. We want new drugs. We don't want to go back to the Middle Ages. But they don't have to be rewarded by monopolies that allow them to hike the price to the moon. They could be rewarded, for example, and that's what I've proposed in detail, they could be rewarded on the basis of the health impact of their inventions. So anybody who invents a new drug registers that drug and for a certain period of years gets paid out of big annual reward pools in proportion to how much health gain the drug produces in the world, on condition that this agent sells the drug at cost, which is very minimal in the case of pharmaceuticals. You can crank these things out at very, very low prices. So here the incentives of pharmaceutical companies would be preserved. They would try to develop the drugs that are going to have the greatest health impact. They're going to bring these drugs to everybody, as many people as possible. The more people who take my drug, especially poor people, the more health impact I have and the more money I get paid. And that money would, come, would be given into the reward pools by governments who would pay in proportion to their gross national products. Some system like that would preserve the incentives for innovators, would focus pharmaceutical companies much more than they are now focused on health gains rather than just on selling something that they pretend has health impact. And it would give poor people immediate access to new medicines. Would you be happy with this solution? Yes, thank you very much. Thank we have another question. Another question. Hi, this is already going into the direction of uh, solutions. By the way, my name is Maria. Um, I'm studying international migration. But I was, um, when looking for solutions for, for the things that, that you were talking about, mm -hmm. thinking that, okay, if we, we go vote and then um, we hope that change will happen, like, for example, great opportunities seems to happen um, a couple of months ago when uh, the Greek government changed. And um, I was very hopeful. But in the end, it seems that institutional change is slower or more impossible than, than I would hope. So I'm, I'm wondering what to do now? Is there like civil disobedience, take to the streets? Is there more than we can, that we can do in your mind? How can we take on multinational corporations mm -hmm. or powerful supranational governments? You can certainly not do it by voting alone, right? If you just confine yourself to voting once every four years or once every five years, forget about it. You're not going to have an influence. Because ultimately, politics are made in this day-to-day -day struggle and these multinational corporations, banks, hedge funds, whatever, they are lobbying 24-7. They're always, always lobbying. They have well-paid people, hundreds and hundreds of them in Washington, in Brussels, in The Hague. And you have to be present there too. You have to write blogs. You have to mobilize. You have to get people on the streets. Right? The uh, disaster of the current rules wouldn't be happening if you had a few 10,000 mobilized students who were, let's say, chaining themselves to classrooms or uh, creating a mess in Amsterdam or better in The Hague and 
keeping up the pressure on governments and keeping the attention of the country focused on the issues that really matter. Because many of these issues are not even noticed in the media, in the public. Most people don't even know. So intellectual property rights, right? You talk to people about how poor people lost their access to advanced medicines. And people say, oh, really? Did this really happen? I didn't notice that. And of course you didn't notice it because it didn't make a difference in the Netherlands. It made a difference in India and Africa. So you have to bring these issues to public attention and you have to confront people with it, win people's hearts and minds to say, well, this is something we really cannot do. The Dutch government cannot participate in such a unjust change of the like rules. Like you did when you were a young student and the Vietnam War? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, uh, I'm not sure how p uh, proud I should be about it. We, I think we did end the Vietnam War. My generation did successfully end the Vietnam War. That would have gone on. Also, through their incredibly courageous resistance, the so-called Tet Offensive, which is better called the Tet Uprising, in 1968, where they sacrificed tens of thousands of people in the South uh, to uh, fight and to sort of signal to the world that we are collectively against it. We are, no, this is not our government, the, the South Vietnamese government, it was called. So, but uh, there were mass movements all over the rich countries and the cost of the war eventually became too high and the American policy establishment said, okay, we quit, fine, this is it. You know, we've achieved our main objective which was to keep communism out of Indonesia and uh, Vietnam, it doesn't really matter what happens to Vietnam, it's a small little country. Right. So this is what we could do. We could raise up and protest against um, the government and the multinationals. Yes. Um, but let's get back what the United States, uh, United Nations are proposing at the moment because they're pro proposing a follow-up uh, set of goals, mm -hmm. the sustainable development uh, goals. Are you more positive about them or are they going to make exactly the same mistake? Uh, they're making exactly the same mistakes and they're making a few new ones because they're much longer. It's uh, 17 goals, 169 targets and uh, so it's a more colorful array of things. It's not so heavily focused on health. Uh, there is, after much, much fighting, in which I was involved in, we have an inequality goal in there. And uh, what is and the inequality goal? What is the inequality goal? Thank you that you asked. Uh, target 10-1. It says that by 2030, inequality should have begun sustainably to have been reduced. But that's this is very not abstract. Yeah, what this means is basically until 2029, inequality can rise as much as it likes, and then it should have begun to sustainably reduce. So for the next 14 years, don't worry about inequality. 1929, 2029, we'll start uh, reducing it. This is target 10.1, if you want to read it up yourself. It's the open working group, which is a document which is very likely to be adopt, adopted more or less unchanged. And so that's what, the, what these guys are thinking about inequality. Obviously, that's uh, ridiculously inadequate. The very, very minimum we should be asking for is that inequality in the world, both national and global, should be significantly lower in 2030 than it is today. Right. As Pick uh, Thomas Piketty was here last year to yeah. discuss his book, of course, um, um, Capital in the 21st Century, and he's predicting that we are going towards levels of inequality like back in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, do you share his idea that inequality will actually grow instead of wh what you're aiming for uh, reduce? We are at that level already, right? At least uh, if you look at the US inequality, for example, we are right back at that level. So take the top one hundredth of one percent of the US income distribution. It was over six percent in 1928. It dropped to 0.86 percent in 1978. And it's right back up over six percent. Huge shift in the country. Now, how will it continue in the future? I refuse to answer that. I'm saying this is up to us. The future is open. We decide whether inequality continues to go up. Of course, if we let the powers that be uh, determine policies, then, of course, they will put policies in place that will make that increase. This year, where we celebrate the MDGs, will also be the year where, for the first time in human history, the top 1% of the human population 
will own half the privately owned wealth. The other 99% own the other half. So, yes, the trend is against us, but the trend is not inevitable. And the right. bottom 50% owns only a couple of percent of all uh, 0 .6, wealth. 0.6, yeah. 0.6. And how many, this is a good question for you guys. If you take the richest people in the world, how many people do you need to make up as much wealth as is owned by the bottom half? The same 0.6%. How, how many, many people? How many people? 30,000. 30,000. Who bids more or less? Louder. Huh? 100. I hear 100. 100. 85. 85. This is, uh, was correct a short while ago. It's 66 is the number. Okay. According to the latest He buys Forbes. a drink for everyone. Yeah. 66 people at the top. Bill Gates and Mr. Slim and Mr. Buffett. 66 people have as much wealth as the bottom half, which is 3.65 billion people. Right. So... That's extraordinary, and um, we've talked, we touched upon a bit of the solutions. Clearly, um, there is a, a lack of faith and hope in the sustainable development goals as well. Um, we've talked a bit on what we sort of can do. We, we should rise up how mm -hmm. abstract that actually sounds. What could you say to the students here as a sort of first step towards a more just world as they walk out of here? So two things in particular that are important. One is don't think about it in terms of stark Manichaean black and white terms. You know, many people are inclined to think that we have to change the system in very fundamental ways. We, you know, we have to throw out capitalism and endorse socialism or something like that. Every little bit helps. So the, um, the international order or the global order consists of many different elements and we should fight over each of these elements and uh, making it a little bit more just means that we get a little bit more even income distribution which means that we are empowering poor people to become our allies in the fight for justice. Every little bit helps. So don't think that if you can't achieve a fundamental change, then nothing is worth doing. The second big piece of advice is don't think of the ruling elites as being one homogeneous blob. They are also diverse. They are constantly fighting with each other. They are very many different interests and very often you can achieve political progress by making common cause with some elements in the ruling class. And that's something that you actually have to do at the present state, which is a pretty lousy state of the distribution of political power. You have to try to find allies who are not like yourselves, morally motivated, but who are prudentially motivated, have a commercial interest in helping you with this or the other more just module in getting that going. So these would be two, I think, important strategic pieces of advice. Now, you have spent your life uh, fighting for global justice, one could say. At least you have written a huge amount of articles about global justice, about the hunger program, uh, problem, about the challenge of, of hunger. Um, when will you be satisfied? When is it, when is the world, when can we speak of global justice? So, uh, I will probably, certainly in my lifetime, not be satisfied, but I would say as a first very important way station is if we get to the point where human rights are fulfilled insofar as that's reasonably possible. That's a very, very, if you think about it, unambitious goal, right? Just basic human rights to be satisfied and yet more than half the human population does not have their human rights satisfied as it is now totally unnecessarily so. That is totally avoidable. And at the very least, we should achieve that. Now, a world in which human rights are uh, satisfied is still a world that could be unjust in many important ways. For example, it could be a world in which the rich get richer much faster than the poor and in which enormous inequalities persist. The poor are just at the level where their human rights are barely satisfied and the rich are getting richer and richer and that would obviously be an unjust world. But at least let's make that our first temporary goal get to the point where human rights are satisfied and that would already be a fantastic improvement over the status quo. So that is the aim for the future, for now? Well, f the immediate aim, let's say, yeah. We have two, a few questions. Does it work? Yes. Oh, thanks. 
Um, I was just wondering about the Global Health Impact Fund. Who is at this moment, oh, thank you. Who is at this moment sponsoring it? Uh, so we have now a, a pilot that we are trying to implement, which is called the MINI-HIF, the Mini Health Impact Fund. And this would be a one-shot reward pool of between 60 and $200 million dollars that would be given to innovators who do something new with one of their existing drugs. So, for example, they have a pediatric formulation or a heat-stable version or combine it with a diagnostic or something. We would collect proposals and we would then uh, let these accepted proposals be worked on for three years and at the end of the three years the reward pool would be divided among these various innovators in proportion to the health impact they will have achieved. Who will sponsor that? So we have uh, we are in negotiations now with various governments to support it. The German government, the Indian government, uh, we have the Gates Foundation, the Soros Foundation. So we are trying very hard to get these 200 million together. Uh, I should mention Unitaid is another big prospect uh, organization in Geneva. So we hope we can get enough of these players in. The Dutch government would be great to have on board. Uh, to collect that amount of money to demonstrate, first, that we can measure health impact reliably, second, that we can divide, uh, sort of incentivize innovation, get good in innovation on the basis of health impact, can incentivize innovators to do extra things to enhance the health impact of their medicines, and also to show to governments how much additional health impact we can actually produce for a given amount of money. So hopefully that next step will succeed. And if this relatively small step of 60 to $200 million will succeed, then hopefully the world will be prepared to fund the much more expensive health impact fund, which would cost about $6 billion annually. And when will, hear, when will we hear more of this, of the results of the negotiations? Well, uh, this year, I hope. I'm scheduled to talk to Unitate this year. I'm talking to the German government. Indian, I've just came from India, talked to people there. So hopefully we get a funding coalition together. Interestingly, governments are a little bit like teenagers on the dance floor. You know, everybody's a little shy. Nobody wants to be first in making a commitment. But You're the first to hustle everyone. Well, <laughs> but I've got no money, you know. <laughs> so what we need is somebody who says, I'll be the first. I put six million dollars in. And B Bill, if we had Bill that, Gates got the money. Yeah, Bill Gates got the money. I know, I know. All right, know. we've got time for two more questions. Thank you, yes. Uh, my name is Alejandro Jaramillo. I'm from Colombia, and I'm visiting my daughter here in the University of Amsterdam. Over the past 15 years, I've had the opportunity to travel around Latin America frequently. And uh, the Brazilian government says that over the last 12 years, it's lifted 30 million people out of poverty. Same thing with the government of Colombia. And you do see some improvement. They, you know, you talk to people, you see that they're wearing shoes as opposed to walking uh, barefoot. And you, you, you know, you, 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 anecdotally, you do see some, some improvement in the, in, the, in the living standards of people. Has there really not been an improvement over the last few, few years as they claim to, do, to have? Two things on that. The first thing is, I think by focusing on improvement, we are focusing on the wrong thing. And that's one important ideological bit about the MDGs and the SDGs. They're focusing our attention on the progress we have supposedly made. And of course, you can dispute that progress to some extent, but I won't deny that there has been some progress. Of course not. But the point about the world is you have to compare the status quo, not to what happened in 1990, but to what would now be possible. Imagine for a moment somebody defended slavery in 1840 and said, look, everything is better about slavery than it was in 1815. In 1815, families were ripped apart. Slaves were whipped almost daily. Slave girls were raped all the time. This happens much less often today. So slavery has become a lot better. So what are you complaining about? Our answer would be, it doesn't matter that slavery was even worse in 1815 than it is now. What matters is that slavery now is avoidable and we should avoid it, we should abolish it. And that's all I'm saying about poverty. Maybe poverty was worse in 1990 by some measures than it is now. But much of it, all of it, 
is now avoidable. We can avoid it, we can abolish it, and the fact that it was even worse 25 years ago or 200 years ago, whatever, is neither here nor there. It's really irrelevant. So, Second point, can I just say yeah, one sure. more thing about Brazil? Brazil is a good example. Lula has achieved real progress. Inequality was enormous in Brazil, and it has finally come down a little bit. The Bolsa Familia program was a great success. But of course, it's all very fragile, and you have Brazil now in a deep recession, and things are going to get a lot worse in Brazil before they will get any better again. Thank you. Thanks a lot for a question. We have time for one short question. Do you have a short question? Sh short question, please. Yeah, well, um, I was triggered by what you said about the institutional racism. How can you separate the workings of the global economy from structural hierarchies and mechanisms of oppression such as racism, orientalism, and sexism rooted in a particular history and, coloniali and in colonialism? And do these hierarchies not influence, if not determine, the distribution of wealth, therefore drive economic inequality through particular mechanisms that deserve attentions? Yeah, What's so your question? I just, that's it. No, it's, it's, it's Was it clear? Clear enough, yeah, okay. it's clear enough. So the thing is, that what, what I'm, is, I'm certainly not denying that racism and sexism are enormously powerful forces that explain a lot of the maldistribution of income and wealth in the world and much else. That they are rooted in history. Hmm? And that they are rooted in history, rooted history, in history of colonialism. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, colonialism was a horrendous crime and it has enormous repercussions on the present. And so if you want to explain the present distribution of income and wealth, who is rich and who is poor, you couldn't possibly begin to explain it without looking at that horrendous history of colonialism. All I'm saying is, turning this around, if you were to get rid of racism and sexism, which of course are still quite present in the world today, that would not be the end of injustice. The injustice would go on, despite that fact, because that injustice would be perpetuated by the fact that those people who are much richer than others, who for the most part are white people, continue to influence the rules in their own favor and thereby continue to defend and even expand their economic advantage over the rest of the world. So racism and sexism are extremely important elements in the explanation of how we got to where we come, but getting rid of them is not going to be the be-all and end-all. It's not going to be sufficient. It's, of course, necessary to achieve justice, but it's not sufficient to achieve justice because even in a ideal gender-blind and race-blind world, the injustice of rich and poor and perpetuating and enhancing inequalities on the basis of their rule-shaping powers, that would persist. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up at this point. Thank you so much um, for your contribution in this interview and for your sharing with your wisdom with us. We have one last question on behalf of Room for Discussion. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, Jean Trichet, Trichet is coming, yeah. the former president of the ECB. Um, what should we ask him? One question from your side. Um, what should you ask him? There's a lot of things that you should ask him. So, uh, maybe ask him about what we can do in terms of our monetary policies in Europe to avert what looks like a very nasty uh, recession coming up in the developing countries. So there is a, a very bad recession on the horizon. In Latin America it's already beginning, of course Russia, and uh, it may well affect other, especially resource-rich countries in Africa. And what can we do to uh, avert that recession or to mitigate its impact. Thanks a lot for that answer. He has written it down. Um, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Um, you have to fly back to the New York in a couple right. of hours. Uh, thank you so much for coming, especially to sure. Amsterdam, for this session. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your questions. Please all give a warm hand for Professor Dr. Thomas Pogge. <laughs>
so much for supporting